Well, good morning, uh, seniors. Uh, this is Bishop Gaynor, and I'm, I'm very happy for this opportunity to be with you at your school this morning, uh, and also for the next three uh, Lenten Wednesdays. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you and then also to uh, have conversation with you. Uh, I've got some material prepared for these weeks, but I most especially welcome our interaction. Uh, so uh, I'll stop in time. I, th I think we've got about 45 minutes to spend together this morning. That's the plan. And uh, I'll try to stop so that there's uh, adequate time for you to uh, ask me some questions. I don't know if the topics were uh, uh, published in your, in your school, but uh, the, the four topics that uh, I uh, had recommendations on from our school's office and from some of the schools and the ones that I put together uh, are these. Today I'd like to talk about the question, how can we say that the Catholic Church is the church founded by Jesus Christ? How, how, how can we say that? The second is uh, looking at our church and even broader Christianity uh, and its relationship to non-Christian religions, especially Islam. That's a, a very uh, hot topic in the news today of all of the things that are going on in the world. And it might be a help for us to consider something about that particular um, uh, religion, Islam, and our relationship as uh, followers of Christ to those who are non-Christian. Uh, the third uh, week, I'd like to talk about what I called the Big Bang Theory and, and Genesis. And in a broader way, the relationship between our reason, our, our intellectual faculties, and our faith. Some people think they're like oil and water. They just don't go together. You get one or the other, but you can't have both. I'd like to analyze that idea and look at the reality of science and religion or faith and reason. And then finally, for the fourth, uh, you guys will be heading off from your uh, all high school alma maters in, in a rather short time. And I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, will be heading off to some college campus. And I'd like to talk about uh, keeping your faith uh, as you leave high school and uh, go on to the next level of your life. Um, how do we do that? What are some uh, ideas of doing that? So those are the four topics that I've chosen for our, our time together over these next four Wednesdays. Um, let's begin with a prayer. Our topic today is, is our Catholic Church. And, and here's a prayer uh, that includes that in the intention of the prayer. So let's pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O oh God, in the covenant of your Christ, you never cease to gather to yourself from all nations a people growing together in unity through the Spirit. Grant, we pray, that your church, faithful to the mission entrusted to her, may continually go forward with the human family and always be the leaven and the soul of human society to renew it in Christ and transform it into the family of God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mary, Mother of the Church, pray for us. Well, let's begin with a quote from the Second Vatican Council. You know, we're celebrating this year the 50th anniversary of the fourth and final session of the Council. So in the fall, I'm sure there'll be some celebrations of the conclusion of the Second Vatican Council, which ended in 1965. And a very important document from the Council called the Dogmatic Constitution on the Church. Its Latin name is Lumen Gentium, the light of the nations. But it's all about the Church. And in the eighth section of that document, you'll find this paragraph. And I think this is central to our topic this morning. It reads like this. This is the one church of Christ, which in the creed is professed as one holy, Catholic, and apostolic, which our Savior, after his resurrection, commissioned Peter to shepherd, and him and the other apostles to extend and direct with authority, which he erected for all ages as the pillar and mainstay of the truth. This church constituted and organized in the world as a visible society subsists in the Catholic Church, which is governed by the successor of Peter and by the bishops in communion with him. 
although many elements of sanctification and of truth are found outside of its visible structure. These elements, as gifts belonging to the Church of Christ, are forces impelling toward Catholic unity. That's the quote from the Dogmatic Constitution on the Church. And so if I could sum that up, uh, what was the teaching of the Council and what has been the teaching of the Church for 20 centuries is that the Church that Christ intended, the Church that was founded by Christ, continues to exist fully in the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, however, outside of the visible structure of that church, in other Christian denominations, outside of the Catholic Church, there are many elements by which men and women are made holy, elements of sanctification, the council called them, and elements of truth, God's holy word and scripture, uh, other teachings of the church. These can be found in the Christian denominations, but the fullness of what Christ intended his church to be through history subsists. That's the word the council used. It subsists. It continues to exist fully, continues to exist fully in the Roman Catholic Church. So we believe then that our Catholic Church is gifted. This isn't something we achieved. This isn't something we, we, we took some tests and, and God gave us the highest mark. Uh, we are gifted with the fullness of the means of salvation. That's what it's all about, right? We go through this earthly journey uh, with the idea of living in God's kingdom here so that we can come to the fullness of that in the glory of heaven. And the means to achieve that end, to arrive at the glory of eternal life in heaven, the fullness of those means resides in our Catholic Church. It also means to say that every baptized person, every baptized Christian is in some degree, in some way, related to the Catholic Church. If the Church of Christ subsists, continues to exist fully in the Catholic Church, that everyone who is baptized is in some level of union, a degree of communion with us in the Catholic Church. Um, they bear the name Christian, uh, even though they may not profess the fullness of our Catholic faith, or they may not have preserved unity or communion with the successor of St. Peter, uh, which is the Bishop of Rome, the Pope. But elements of truth, elements of sanctification are certainly found in all the Christian denominations. I think I'd like to, before we look uh, more specifically at how we can make this statement, um, some, I think some background, and this is trying to be very honest about this whole question. Um, is the church really important? Do, do you believe that? There are many people who think the church is unimportant. They'll say that I'm a spiritual person, but I'm not religious. In other words, I, I have a relationship with God, but that doesn't relate to uh, any organized religion. I don't need the church. I can talk to Jesus. I can talk to God the Father. I can feel the Spirit move my life. So that the church is not at all important. Um, do you believe that it is? Do you believe that the church is essential for your relationship with Christ? Or do you simply believe in a personal me and Jesus kind of relationship? Is the church necessary for salvation? For 20 centuries, we believe that it is. But those are questions I think that we have to honestly ask ourselves. The other thing I think, and I'm trying to be very honest with you, is that we're troubled in many ways today in our, in our culture by claims of exclusivism. If we say that the church that Jesus founded is, subsists, it, it continues to exist fully in the Catholic Church, well, well doesn't that sound a little bit uh, exclusive thinking? You know, why, why do we say that? We're, we're in an age of tolerance, an age of pluralism, and uh, you, you might worry or be uncomfortable with that idea, that, that, that truth, that claim, uh, that the Catholic Church is the fullness of what Christ intended. All right, there are a lot of people who say, well, all religious roads lead to God. Okay? If you follow them sincerely, uh, you're gonna get to heaven. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, that's a very comfortable way of thinking, and I have to say that it sounds very enlightened. It sounds very contemporary. That well, any, any, any road, will, any religious road, if you're sincere about it, will, will get you there, just to, just to be spiritual. I'd ask you to think carefully 
about that attitude. It's prevalent. It's everywhere. You breathe it. it, it, it it's all around us. Um, analyze that attitude, though. For instance, Satanism is a religion. It is. Sadly to say, it is. And if you follow that sincerely, does that lead you to God? Does that bring us to heaven and salvation? I doubt that anyone would say that it does. So to say that all religions are the same and, and ultimately they'll get us to eternal happiness, you have to analyze that, take that apart and see the, the flaw in that thinking. Right? We can't run from the hard questions. So there is such a thing as objective truth. We believe that. It's, it's objective, it's independent of the knowing person. And Aristotle, you know, this isn't even Christian, but long before Christ, the, the Greek philosopher um, Aristotle said, saying, what is truth? He was trying to uh, say, what is truth in his uh, philosophy? And he said this, truth is saying of what is that it is, and saying of what is not that it is not. Now that sounds like double talk, but saying of what is that it is. This is the truth, it's objective. It's outside of me. I'm not making it up. I'm simply discovering what is objectively true and saying that it is true, or discovering what's not true and saying that it is not true. Um, so having said those couple things, let's, let's begin to look at this idea. And we have to start, first of all, um, being honest, um, that we believe the church is a mystery. Right? And I say that because every time you go to Mass, at least on a Sunday or a solemnity, we recite the Nicene Creed at the Mass, and we actually say we believe in the Church. Okay? We believe in God the Father Almighty, we believe in Jesus the Son, we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and Giver of life. We also believe in the one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. In order to say that, that it's an article of faith, it must be a mystery. It, it must be something that's beyond our comprehension, beyond our human ability to, to totally define, uh, to totally describe. Uh, and, and so it's important to remember that, that the church is an article of our faith. It, it's a mystery, it, it, there's, it's supernatural. It's not just the human visible organization that you see, it's not just the the, the church that's built on some street in your town. Um, it's not just the people who are engaged in that, but rather, uh, in addition to being that visible organ, human organization, it is a community of grace. Uh, it, it is the, the body of Christ, the mystical body of Christ. And, and so we have to keep that in mind, I think, as, as we um, uh, try to consider uh, what is the church. I, I think, first of all, in a sense, the history, the public history of the church begins with the call of Abraham. Right? God gathering to himself this individual and promising that all nations, that, that a great people would uh, flow from uh, Abraham and uh, that they would be God's uh, favored uh, people. So uh, this idea of God trying to undo the isolation, the alienation that came about through the first sin of our parents in the garden is calling to himself and beginning to gather a people. That's really the preparation, and the history of salvation in the Old Testament is the preparation for the birth of the church. God selecting, gathering people, and drawing close to them through a covenant. Now, you begin to see in some of the later prophets this idea that God is going to do something even greater than the covenant that was established with Moses on Sinai. Jeremiah chapter 31 says this, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be the covenant I made with their fathers the day I took them by the hand and led them from the land of Egypt. A, a new covenant. Um, this theme that God will do something new, something bigger and better, uh, is found throughout the later prophets. And of course, that promise is fulfilled in the covenant that Jesus gives us. And remember what he says, and we hear it at every Mass at the table of the Last Supper, this is the cup of my blood, the new and eternal covenant which will be poured out for you. And so the new covenant, uh, which perfects, completes what was begun in the Hebrew Scriptures, um, is sealed in the blood of Christ, 
in his death and then in his resurrection. Remember that Jesus did say, I didn't come to destroy the old. Right? This, this isn't just blowing up what was there and putting something new, but rather it brings the old to its fulfillment. Right? It completes or perfects what God had been doing through the centuries with the people of the, cov the, first, the first covenant. So God is building on what was, what was already there when he establishes the new covenant and when he establishes the people of the new covenant, the new Israel, the church. Right? Uh, and remember uh, that Jesus said at the end of his time, at the time of the ascension, that all nations uh, would be a part of this new covenant, not just a single ethnic group, uh, but rather all nations go forth, teach all nations, baptize them. And so every people, all humanity is to be embraced by the new Israel, uh, by the church founded by Christ. Of course, we know clearly in the Gospels that Jesus had followers. He had some disciples who were closer to him. And then within that group of close disciples, he chose 12. Now, that's not just an accidental number, huh? choosing 12 from among his followers. They represent the 12 tribes of Israel. And that's why the church is often called the New Israel for the New Covenant. The 12 apostles represents the original 12 tribes that uh, were the uh, sons uh, of Jacob, whose name was later changed to Israel. Right? And the Gospels are clear that Jesus chose one of the 12 a guy whose name was Simon, and he actually changed his name uh, to Peter, meaning the rock, the foundation, the leader of this new visible uh, church. Uh, so those are things that are clear, and all Christians believe though in the word of God. Certainly the, the Gospels have the authority of, of, uh, of, of divine authorship, and, and so it's right there to be read in, in, in the Gospels. Um, it's also very clear by our Lord's intention and what we read from the Acts of the Apostles and the, the letters of St. Paul and, and the others in the New Testament that the followers of Jesus never saw themselves just as isolated individuals. Right? It wasn't a one-on-one -on -one with Jesus, but rather um, they were called to be part of a community this might be another challenging idea as we, our culture gets us more and more separated. Families are, are, are less together at times. Um, uh, this was just part and parcel of the culture um, in, in which our, our Lord uh, lived and, and certainly for much part of humanity. I think we're, we're, we're seeing a real strain today on, on, on the different levels of community that should be very supportive to us and many times are not. Uh, you're in a community right now at school um, uh, but we have our family, we have our parish, we have uh, the, the communities, the civil communities in which we live, and somehow a lot of those bonds are being diminished or weakened. Um, but it's very clear that Jesus did not intend his followers to be isolated individuals, uh, rather to be part of a body, part of a community. Um, the Second Vatican Council, in that same document I, I quoted at the beginning, but at paragraph nine, says this, it has pleased God to make men holy and save them not merely as individuals without any mutual bonds, but by making them into a single people, a people which acknowledges him in truth and serves him in holiness. So by baptism, you're part of a people. You necessarily belong to Christ but you are in, a, in, in an essential communion, a community with all the others who are baptized into Christ. Um, and and there, there are many uh, evidences of this uh, where the, this community in the New Testament is simply called the church. Okay? At Galatians chapter 1, verse 13, Paul is thinking of his earlier life when he persecuted the Christians. He wanted to wipe them out. And he says... Um, I was violently persecuting the church of God. He uses the word church for the, the people, the communities that he was trying to uh, wipe out. Um, in Acts of the Apostles, uh, Saul uh, is, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, it, it refers to Saul on the day when a, a terrible persecution uh, broke out uh, against the church in Jerusalem. 
So once again, that word church appears uh, for this community of, of believers. Uh, and Jesus himself used the term. Uh, remember when Peter makes his, his profession of faith at that place called Caesarea Philippi, and he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus says to Peter, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Um, this particular passage is a very important one, and um, it, it, scripture scholars relate it to an incident in the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 22. Um, and in there, Isaiah is sent to go to a man by the name of Shebna, who was the master of the palace. He's kind of like the second in command of the king's palace and the whole, all the operation at where the king lived and where, business, where the business of the kingdom took place, the master of the palace. And Shebna was getting fired because he was, he was not doing well. And a new man, Eliakim, is appointed. And in Isaiah chapter 22, you, you see here this, uh, the same thing, what you loose, we'll loose, what, I, what you bind, the king will bind. Uh, this was an important office, a continuing office in uh, Israel. And there's a parallel then to what Jesus is doing in his kingdom, in his church, Peter now is, you might say, the master of the house. Uh, all of this authority is invested in him. And that's an amazing thing to think that what Peter would decide on earth, God would agree with in heaven. That's an amazing uh, compliment, but an amazing burden, too, to place on a human. If you, if, you, if you decide something's binding or it's not binding, heaven will agree with you. It's almost unthinkable that our Lord would invest that authority in a person, a human person and one that we saw who was so frail and had uh, lots of problems and made many mistakes, but Jesus did. Jesus trusted him. Now, uh, the last part of my, my talk here before we have some conversation, I hope, um, is, is to say that very early on, Christian writers uh, argued that the church founded by Christ had four characteristics. Uh, they recognized, and we heard them from the Vatican Council document, they were mentioned in there, but they're very familiar to you, these four marks of the church or characteristics of the church, um, because they're found in our most important formulas of belief. Okay, I already mentioned at Mass the, the creed from the Council of Nicaea and a later Council of Constantinople, but Nicaea was held in the year 325. Uh, that creed that we say at Mass, that formula of our faith, uh, contains the words, I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. The Apostles' Creed, which also comes from the fourth century, possibly a little later than the Nicene uh, part of it, uh, also says that I believe in the holy Catholic church, that it has two of the marks, holy Catholic, but the one that's become standard is one holy Catholic and apostolic. From the very earliest time, these were what characterized the church founded by Christ. So. The church is one. Um, why would Jesus intend a multiplicity of, of churches? Um, it, 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 it's, it's not like ice cream where you've got chocolate, vanilla, and a thousand other flavors. Uh, it shouldn't be. Um, Jesus uh, certainly wanted his message to be cohesively spread and to unite people into this new Israel, into his church, and to have a... Um, multiplicity of people preaching the gospel with different shades of meaning, different interpretations, different structures, only impedes the spread of the gospel. Sometimes people refer to that, and all of us, Catholics and non-Catholics alike, as the scandal um, of Christianity. Hmm? Uh, what should people believe? I never heard of Christ, and now I've got three or five or ten people preaching Christ, but in a different way. It impedes the spread of the gospel, and it inhibits people accepting. It's confusing. Uh, and, and so we recognize, and that's one reason why now there's a great effort to see if we can't all kind of get back on the same page, to restore, as Jesus prayed at the Last Supper, that all may be one, as you and I, Father, are one, that we may be in them and they in us, so that that unity might be preserved. Well, unfortunately, it hasn't been preserved over the centuries, but there's a great effort now, inspired by God the Holy Spirit, to, to bring uh, many of the believing Christian denominations uh, into a greater unity. Because 
it means greater success for spreading the gospel, less confusion, less obstacles to people. Who, when they hear the gospel, they see a greater uh, unity among those who are living it and preaching it. And St. Paul, in his writings, very, very clear, uh, in Ephesians chapter 4, he says this, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father for us all, who is above all and through all and in all. That unity can't be clearer as a sign of the church, both internally and uh, the various churches spread throughout the world, united in the one universal Catholic church. Uh, that's the, the mark of unity. Holiness, the one holy Catholic, um, it's important to know, and this one people might be very confused about, well, the church isn't holy. Look at, we had popes who did some terrible things. We have members of the church, clergy and laity um, and religious who have failed to be holy people. Absolutely true. But it's important to remember that the holiness of the church isn't the aggregate of its members. The church isn't holy because everybody in it is, is holy. It's, it's not like if you were to start a club at school for smart students and everybody in it had to have an IQ of 125 or more and if you didn't you couldn't be in it. Well then everybody, that's a smart club, that's a club of smart people and everybody in it has some higher level of intelligence. That's not what we mean when we say the church is holy. It's not holy because the members are holy, it's holy because it is the body of Christ and Christ is holy. Right, that's this part of the mystery, huh? that we are the mystical body of Christ and the church is inseparably linked to Christ and Christ inseparably linked to the church. That answers that first uh, issue that I raised. You know, can I simply be related to Christ and uh, eliminate this whole church thing? Can't I simply be spiritual and, and follow Jesus myself and not? not be a member of the church? Well, the answer is no. That thinking would be totally foreign to Christ, totally foreign. Uh, he is linked to the church and the church is linked to him. If you are in Christ, you are in the church. Uh, there's just no two ways about that. Um, and uh, the church is holy because the goods of salvation have been entrusted to the church. The word of God in scripture, the sacred tradition by which we have additional revelation, the truths of the faith that we teach, the sacraments, the ministries in the church, the offices of the church. These are the means to holiness and the means to sanctification and they have been entrusted to the church uh, and so the church is holy. The third mark is Catholic, um, one holy Catholic church and that word is a very interesting one. It was first used by a great saint, one of the fathers of the church. And I mentioned uh, the fathers of the church. The, in the first eight centuries, those Christian authors um, wrote about what the church looked like, uh, how the church functioned, how it was organized and hierarchically structured, what the church believed. Uh, these are found in these wonderful treasures of writing of these authors of the, the, the first eight centuries. Um, and you have to say, well, which church still looks like that? Uh, which church that they're describing, which was the Church of Christ, how, what, how has that continued in, in human history? And uh, most folks looking around will say, well, the church that has all of that is the Catholic Church. It still has preserved all of those things. Now, the father I'm talking about here is someone who died in the year 107, so the very beginning of the second century, 107. It's said that he was a disciple of St. John, the evangelist and apostle. He was a disciple of his, and he was made bishop of Antioch by St. Peter himself. That's where Peter went first and presided over the church at Antioch before he went on to Rome. And Peter made Ignatius, St. Ignatius of Antioch, the Bishop of Antioch. So in, 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 writing, uh, in, in his writings, St. Ignatius of Antioch was the first to use the word Catholic, okay? The first one to use the word Catholic Church. And it's a Greek word, it's, it's a combined word, kata holas, according to the whole. Kata, according to, and holas, the whole. According to the, or in other words, universal. Okay? The word Catholic means universal. And Ignatius used the word Catholic um, to signify the universal mission uh, to all people 
of all time in every place. And he said, this is the church that does that. This is Catholic. And it means that our church proclaims the whole faith and the whole of salvation for the whole person and the whole of humanity. Kato, kata holas, universal, according to the whole. The whole faith to the whole, for the whole of salvation to the whole person to the whole of humanity. Um, so this church continues to teach all that Christ taught and is obliged to teach revealed truth to all. Uh, and finally, uh, that, that final mark, apostolic, one holy Catholic and apostolic. Um, I, I've been quoting scripture, you know, Pope Paul, Ephesians and the Acts of the Apostles and the Gospel of Matthew. Well, uh, that's fine. How do we know that the scripture is inerrant, that there are no mistakes or uh, lies, falsehoods found in scripture? How do we know that that's true? We all Christians go to the scriptures for authority and say this is God's word. Well, we believe that. Why do we, why, why? Um, why is the scripture true? Why is it authoritative? Um, uh, it's simple, how, how did it come about? Well, the church, the church wrote the scriptures. Members of the church wrote the scriptures and the church decided which books belong within the pages of the Bible, the New Testament. Which, which books, there were, there were lots of gospels written, but only four of them were determined to be authentic, canonical Gospels. There's the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of James, all, all sorts of Gospels, but somehow the church decided they're out and these four are in, as well as the rest of the New Testament. So since the church decided what belongs to the Gospel, the church itself must be inerrant, not making a mistake, uh, and, and that's why we believe a Scripture has the authority, is, is inerrant but it's because the, the documents themselves, under the inspiration of the Spirit, but the church guided by the same Spirit, made those decisions and determined uh, which, which of the books are in there. So that when all Christians uh, turn to the Scripture and say, this is God's Word, we know that because the church decided that it was God's Word. Um, we're apostolic in three ways, and I want to say this real quickly, and then maybe you'll have some questions. Um, we're apostolic in our teaching. We're apostolic in our succession. We're apostolic in our mission. In the teaching, in as much as what we hand on as the faith is what we have received from the apostles, so we are apostolic in the teaching of the faith, the content of what we believe. We're apostolic in succession because I'm a bishop and we're, I'm called a successor of the apostles, and we can, in fact, trace back, now we might not have the documentation, but through the laying on of hands in the church, each bishop has a line of succession that ultimately goes back to the apostles themselves. And, and, and this unbroken chain of succession of passing on the office of bishop and bishops ordaining priests and deacons um, is part of what we call apostolic succession, a link, a living link to the church of the apostles and through them to Christ himself. And finally, we're apostolic in mission because the word apostle means one who is sent from the Greek words apostello, to, to be sent out. And the church is apostolic in as much as we are, because of our baptism and confirmation and the other sacrament, the Eucharist and the sacraments, um, we have been given the mission to spread the good news of Jesus. And so we're apostolic just as the apostles went out and preached the gospel and lived the gospel, all of us are apostolic. Um, we, we are sent to live and, and to preach the gospel. Uh, Pope Francis, and this is my final thought, Pope Francis often mentions that every Catholic should be a missionary disciple. Right? A disciple is a learner, but you can spend all your life reading books and learning and going to classes. It, we are missionary disciples. We're always learning but we're also out there teaching and preaching by our words and our example to bring others to Christ. So we're apostolic in our mission. We are missionary disciples. Those are the four point, the points that I wanted to make. One, holy Catholic and apostolic, and with the other background. I, I hope uh, we have some time now. Would, would anyone like to uh, make a comment? I'm, I'm certainly open for any comments you would have or certainly a question um, if, if anyone has one.
don't be afraid. I can give a dumb answer. You can't ask a dumb question. <laughs> are you stretching or do you, uh, yeah, okay. Anyone. Oh, okay. We got two. Who's that? Lancaster? Lancaster. Hello. Hello. How are things in Lancaster? Uh, they're a little cold. Buddy. The cold. Here, too. Yeah. I, uh, I had a question concerning you were, you were talking about uh, all religious All religious roads lead to God. And you brought up Satanism and how that's not true because the religion of Satanism doesn't go towards God. And it's sort of an extreme example, but yeah. Yeah, I understand. And that makes sense, too. I mean, the Satanists aren't going towards God. They're going towards Satan. But all, talking of all other religions, excluding Satanism, their goal is to get to God. And if you truly believe that and you truly want to get to God, and perhaps maybe it is wrong in some way, is, is, our, is our merciful God going to really tell them they're not going to receive the salvation? No. Uh, and that, that's a, an important point. But we'll talk a little bit about that next week, too. Um, uh, the, the church is very clear that if someone does not know, if someone truly is uninformed, uh, you might use the word, and I don't mean this in a pejorative way, but ignorant that Christ is the Savior, that the Catholic Church is the fullness of what Christ intended, um, they are not uh, culpable, they're not responsible for that. That's why it's our job to get that message out. We're not doing it so well all of the time. But if a person uh, does not know this has not been exposed to the truth and therefore can't choose it no then then there are means of truth and sanctification available to them um, a, a, a primitive uh, sp uh, spiritist religion someone who lives in a very remote part of the world uh, and has never heard of Christ never heard of church never heard of even the Old Testament but they're very in a very isolated part of the world if they live their faith according to as they know God and, and are, are sincere in it, they don't cut the corners of whatever their, their, their religion would demand, then they have access to uh, the sanctification and the elements of truth uh, th through that uh, spiritist religion. My, my thought is this, when they close their eyes and leave this world, they will stand before Jesus Christ. And they will recognize in Jesus the fullness of what they saw dimly in their spiritist religion or whatever their faith might have been. Because Jesus is the one savior of the world and we can reach, enter into eternal happiness only through Christ. So anyone who did not know Christ in this world, I, here's, my thought is that when they transition from this life into the next through death, they will stand before Jesus, and if they sincerely practiced uh, their faith as, as it was handed to them and, as they, as, and lived it sincerely, they'll be able to open their arms, and Jesus will open his, and they will embrace. And they'll see in him the completion of what they held to be true, what they thought to be holy. Those of us who, knew Jesus, who know Jesus and who claim to be followers of him but are cutting corners and, and are half asleep or sleepwalking, we're going to have to stand before Jesus like this, and he'll be like this too, because we're not going to be able to embrace. We're not going to be able to be one with him if we uh, were not sincere in the gift of faith we've been given. Does that help? Does that answer your question? Yeah, no, that, that was a lot of help. I have one more question for you. Then. Sure. One as a that visible uh, the giant building on the street, right. and one as a community of, of believers. My question is, do we really need that that visible that visible building? Uh, I don't remember Christ calling and telling Peter to go build a giant church as an ability. He taught us people, and I was just thinking about how Pope Francis is really calling out the materialism in this world nowadays, and and I'm I'm questioning if if the church could could be a role model in neglecting their visible sign and really focusing on the other aspect of the church as a community. Sure. Well, I, I, I think you have a point there in terms of ex extravagance 
and Pope Francis is certainly calling us to uh, be good stewards of what we have. Um, there are probably no more extravagant churches than the ones that he's the pastor of in Rome in his diocese, uh, like St. Peter's. And, but these are treasures. These are, these are art treasures that people at other times, uh, in, other, you know, in other ages, used the very best that they had and called upon the greatest artists and architects and contractors to, to build these beautiful churches. Uh, do we need a place? We definitely need a place to gather. We, we need a sacred place for the community to come together uh, to offer liturgy, to worship. Now, what that looks like is in some places it's a mud hut. Now, in some places it's the back of a jeep on a battlefield. Uh, in some places it's a very elaborate and uh, beautiful building. Um, it, that doesn't matter, but we, we, if we're able, we should be giving our best to God. And so here in the Diocese of Harrisburg, we, we've got a couple construction projects uh, underway, and we want that community to be able to build uh, a, a very appropriate and beautiful uh, church uh, as best as they can. Uh, the, 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 the building is a sign uh, of our faith, of our willingness to sacrifice, but it's also a visible, tangible, sensible sign of the community that meets there. So the building is a church only because it's where the church gathers. And I, I agree with you that we, uh, Pope Francis is calling us, and we should be called by the gospel itself, to a simplicity, um, to a, um, uh, an evangelical poverty, a detachment that is part of uh, what Jesus asks of us. Um, at the same time, we have these gems, these beautiful, and, and in our diocese, we have some very, very beautiful churches that people sacrificed greatly for. I, I'm sure, you know, the Irish folks built St. Patrick's Cathedral. It's a magnificent church built in 1907. I'll bet you a lot of people there gave to the, they really stretched themselves to sacrifice because they wanted a church that honored God and, and honored their faith. So I think we have to respect what has happened in the past and be responsible stewards as we continue the need to build or renovate churches today. Thank you, I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for asking. I, I appreciate your questions. Anyone else? Yeah, yes, please. You mentioned um, the Second Vatican Council and that quote, and how um, elements of truth with, um, still um, belong to the church, even when they're outside the church. How yeah. is that? What's that? How, how is that? that? You know, I, th I think if, if you've got a, 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 want to put a diagram in your mind, if, if, you, if you do some concentric circles, okay, we, like a bullseye, you've got one center here, and if we call that the Church of Christ, what Christ intended, then the Catholic Church is on top of that. We're right there in the center. As you go out, the next row would be the Orthodox churches, both the ancient Eastern churches and the Orthodox churches of the 11th century. They have preserved apostolic succession. They have all the valid sacraments. They teach the apostolic faith. They have lost the, the union with the Bishop of Rome. They, they broke off at various times, but, but the, the, the faith is the same as ours. Um, and, and so they would be the next row out. And then you, you just continue to have these concentric circles um, where those elements of truth and sanctification are present but less intensely. Uh, and, and then on the outside, I, I've, I've, certain theologians of the 20th century would put atheists or those people who never ever heard. They, they are in connection to the church, even if they're not baptized, through their humanity. Because since Christ took on our flesh and the mystery of the incarnation, humanity itself has been changed. We're still couple were still uh, inherited original sin, of course. But nevertheless, when God uh, condescended to send the Father to send his Son to come into the human family and to be conceived by uh, the Virgin Mary uh, and be true God and true man, humanity itself is changed so that anyone who is a human person is inserted into this new order. They're not baptized and they're on this periphery, but nevertheless, um, they are in a relationship to the center. 
because Christ himself took on humanity and all humans have this connection. Now, it depends how they live their lives out here, um, but I think if someone was a sincere atheist who absolutely was, and through no fault of his or her own, I, I'm hoping that God will be merciful to that person. But once again, when he or she opens her eyes on the other side, they're gonna recognize Christ and somehow surrender in love to the savior of the world. Does that answer your question? That, that, that's, if think of concentric circles about those elements of truth and sanctification. As you go out farther and farther, they get more and more uh, diffused. Delone. Delone? We got someone at the mic um, there. Oh, yes, hi. Um, hi, Bishop. Um, <laughs> in your um, uh, discussion of the church as apostolic, you talked um, a little bit about the Canaan. My question is, is it all right to read some books not in the Canaan while noting their doctrinal inaccuracies um, just in order to um, read some of the spiritual truths that they may contain? Um, yeah, I, I would think so, as long as you realize that what you're reading there is not anywhere near Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. If it, let's say you're reading the Gospel of Thomas, well, there are many wonderful things. Now, th these were developed in a, in a group. Um, many of the Gospels came from a group that was known as Gnostics. And uh, it was a, a, at one point, there were probably more Gnostics than there were true uh, Catholic Christians at one point in the history because it was a very popular fallacy. Uh, and, and there was a curiosity about Jesus. So, for instance, you'll find in the Gospel of, of Thomas and others, uh, trying to fill in the gaps. We don't know anything about our Lord from the time he, well, from when he was an infant until he was 12, and then from when he was 12 until he's an adult, about 30 years old. So these gospels oftentimes try to fill in stories, uh, and they might have been popular legends, or, but, but they were determined by the church not to be um, true. And the one thing you have to be uh, careful of when you read those is that the idea of Gnosticism is, is that you receive some kind of knowledge that in itself is saving uh, and no one else has it. You, you, you get initiated into this, this truth and the truth itself is, well, uh, is, 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 uh, um, is a saving power or force. Um, and, and that isn't what we believe. For us, truth is not um, a thing. Truth is a person. It's Jesus. Uh, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, and so it's our relationship with the Lord in and through the church uh, that uh, brings us the, the fullness of truth. So I would say if, if you're uh, you know, in religion, it, it might be good to compare some of the things that are in the non-canonical writings as long as you understand that, um, that they are exactly that, that the church discerned that these are not the authentic word of God. Yeah, you're, you're very welcome. Anyone else? One last shot? No? Oh, no? Yeah, yes, yeah, sir. Very good. Uh, so whenever you're giving your talk, I really think you like, thought about like four main things that you brought up. And it's why do people come to the church? And you know, spread out throughout your talk, you had like three main reasons, right? They want to find the truth. They want to deal with their mortality. They want to know what happens to them after death. And they want freedom from whatever, or a sense of fulfillment, right? What do you think the church is supposed to do? like do is it supposed to give people a way to find the truth that's supposed to help them deal with their mortality what is the church's job exactly church's job, church's job is uh well first of all i, I would say um uh people come to the church because jesus wants them to come to the church uh, he wants us to be in union with him he came for intimacy this was the way we were created in the garden and we lost it 
And the whole history of salvation is trying to restore this communion uh, with God and a communion among ourselves. That was the reason for the election of Israel and the, the covenants in, in the Old Testament. And this is what Jesus accomplishes. He, he brings us into a communion with himself, with God, with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and into a deep union with one another. That's what we really long for. Okay? We're, we're made, uh, you know, if you talk to the Greek, if you read Greek philosophy, we're, we're social animals. We're, we're made to be in relationship. Well, we know why we're social animals, because we're made in the image and the likeness of a triune God, a God who in and of himself exists in a, a community of persons. And therefore, you and I are made to be in a right relationship with God and others. And the church is that locus. The, the church is, is the community which does that for us. So we come to the church to fulfill our deepest human needs, and our deepest supernatural needs. We're made for more than this life, and, and that's eternal life. We're going to spend eternity after we die here. How we spend it will be determined by our relationship with Christ. Since you know of Christ, you've been baptized into Christ, so if we uh, live a life in union with Christ, then our arms will be wide open and so will his. So people are looking for the truth, and Jesus is the truth. Um, we also need to uh, recognize, the, the, I, I talked about apostolic service, uh, mission, because part of that mission isn't simply witnessing to the truth, but it's enacting the truth by service, right? Christian service, to look upon the needs of people and to respond as best we can to that, to recognize Christ in others and serve Christ uh, in people's needs. So um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I'm hitting the nail on the head with your question, but I, I think I would turn around. What people are looking for, uh, Christ is looking for us, and we need to respond to that invitation to come to him. And in him, uh, we have the, uh, the, the fullness of human happiness and uh, fulfillment. Um, Dante, the great Italian poet in, in his... Uh, Divine Comedy has a line I always like to quote, and it's, 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 it's uh, one thing we're looking for is peace, huh? peace of mind, peace within us, peace among us, um, and we don't have a lot of that uh, often. Uh, and Dante said, um, in his will is our peace. Nella sua volontà e nostra pace, in Italian. In his will is our peace. So when we do God's will, and, and that's why Jesus taught us to pray the Our Father, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When God's will is done in me, when I allow that to happen, then I'm at peace. And there's a harmony, there's an intimacy in my life that nothing else can provide. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Hello, it's a, Bishop. Oh, hello. Uh, right here. Oh, hi. Good to see you. For um, Trinity. Earlier in your speech, you had mentioned that there are certain truths revealed in other religions. Uh, do you think it's beneficial for Catholics to study those truths? Well, I, I want to maybe, let me try to clarify that. I'm not saying that they have some truths that we don't. I, I'm saying that the truth that has been revealed by God necessary for our salvation uh, is known in scripture and sacred tradition, which we have in the church. Those truths are present. Like, for instance, love your neighbor, uh, except for Satanism and maybe some other rare things. Uh, most religions would say you need to love others. You need to be kind, whether it ought to be a harmony, uh, uh, a, a, a synergy among people. Um, so, so why is that? Well, we know why that is, because God is love. God is love. It's not something he does, but it's been revealed to us that the very, the very being of God is love, uh, that mutual love of the three persons within the Trinity. That's who God is, and that's why we are to love, because we're made in his image and likeness. You see, we, we, we've got the full uh, context in which to understand that kind of vague uh, imperative in other, yeah, love others, or be kind to others, or do good to others. Um, uh, 
in, in the scripture and sacred tradition, we, we have the very foundation of why that is a spiritual truth and legitimate. So it doesn't hurt. If you're well grounded in your, your Catholic faith, if, if you understand it well, it doesn't hurt to look at other faiths. Uh, right now, I would say your main job is, is to continue to be steeped in the truths of our faith. Um, I, I spent a number of years in campus ministry uh, and then as a bishop, nine years with the, uh, a national group of those who do campus ministry. And, and one of the dangers, and just wait for the fourth week, but, but one of the dangers is, is that um, um, you're challenged uh, in, in certain classes sometimes on, on, on in, in college uh, in higher education uh, regarding the fundamentals and you're not equipped to handle the challenge. And it sounds, seems like everything falls apart because you've got some professor who wants to challenge and you, you, you really need to be better uh, equipped, better steeped. So, so um, there are elements of truth and sanctification, but I think the primary thing is, is that you learn the fullness of truth and, and enjoy the full means of sanctification in our Catholic Church. Yeah, I think it's about time. I, I don't want to. If anyone has any other question, but uh, if there is, please. Uh, but I, we did say about ten o'clock we would wrap up. All right. Well, thank you. I, I certainly appreciate your attention. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, respond to some of your thoughts. Uh, don't hesitate. Uh, next week we're going to look at some of these issues: our our, our Catholic faith, the Christian faith. And how do we relate to non-Christians, and in particular to the religion of Islam? So um, I, I hope uh, uh, we'll all be back together next Wednesday. Thank you so much. Let's just pray. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. God bless you all. Have a great day at school.